Certainly. Councilmember Dominguez? Here. Councilmember Hotchkiss? Here. Councilmember Hart? Here. Councilmember Maria? Here. Councilmember Rouse? Here. And Mayor Patem White? Here. And Mayor Schneider, not present. Thank you. So item one is uh, employee recognition. Mr. Casey? Item one, subject employee recognition service award pins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council members, each month we like to recognize city employees for achieving milestones with their uh, length of service with the city, and I'd like to read their names into the record today. With five years of service, Jason Esp, Carpenter, Public Works Department. With 10 years of service, Jay Benson, Police Officer, Police Department. Lupe Castillo, Custodian, Public Works Department. Linda Cherry, Library Technician with the Library. Michael Epstein, Police Officer in the Police Department. Allison Gruby, Graphic Designer, Community Development Department. Peter Lawson, Associate Planner, Community Development Department. Matt Lombardi, Senior Wastewater Collection System Operator, Public Works Department. Gary Lopez, Senior Wastewater Treatment Plant Operator, Public Works Department. And Tom Malzyko, Wastewater Compliance Specialist, Public Works Department. And with 15 years of service, Rich Ames, Fire Engineer, Fire Department. Renee Brook, City Planner, Community Development Department. Alex Mayorga, Automated Service Writer, Public Works Department. Olga Pasqua, Grounds Maintenance Worker 2, Parks and Recreation Department. And Dana Versala, Senior Grounds Maintenance Worker, Parks and Recreation Department. Thank you, Mr. Casey, and, and thank you, uh, employees, for your service. So that moves us to cha uh, changes in the agenda. Are there any changes? There are none, Mr. Mayor. Okay, great. So now we turn to public comment, uh, those for items that are not on the agenda. I have uh, some speaker slips here. If there are folks that have not submitted one and want to talk, then uh, please submit a slip to uh, Mr. Casey. So I'll start with Gene Tyburn, uh, who is also saying he has other uh, people supporting him. Michael Miranda, is Michael here? Yes. And Pete Dalbello. All right, so Mr. Tyburn has six minutes then. Uh, I actually, I think, thinking about uh, who would I represent, I really represent the, the uh, people in this city. This is a, another plea for good sense from the city council. I'm Gene Tyburn, certified arborist for 40 years. Some of you might be aware of the constant pleas I've made to the council to take control of the city arborist department run by Jill Zachary and Tim Downey. I'll try to be brief with my comments and hope you will be stop defending these bureaucrats and protect the public from silly, ridiculous overregulation that defies any common sense. The city tree department has tried to protect, has to protect, uh, take care of over thousands of trees, thousands, and they're losing that fight. As it's obvious, there have been trees under their control that are falling over, dead, dying, diseased everywhere in the city, even in the city's sunken garden under their nose. Your council has given this overburdened tree department the mandate to interfere with trees on private property while hundreds of trees in the city are dying, dead, fungus, and about to split in two. I have a photo collection of these trees which I will be sending you and making available to the public. This obnoxious secret ordinance mandate has been given to Mr. Downey the right to go on private property and tell homeowners they cannot change the shape of their own tree or how to prune or not to prune their tree over 25% of their own tree. Yes, I said a secret ordinance. In all my many years, I have never met one person who has known about this ordinance until I tell them about it, or when Mr. Downey pounces on them like a giant tarantula to give them a citation. And of course, when I tell the public about it, they think I'm lying. They can't believe it, as they don't believe that a city council could act in an ordinance, enact an ordinance that was so invasive un and unethical. It is an affront to the homeowners in the city of, uh, of tree lovers that a city bureaucrat has the right to interfere with their artistic desires to care for their trees that they love and spend a great deal of money on to make them sure they're, they're healthy and beautiful and on their own property. 
Please note that because I criticized his skills of foresight to protect the public from trees that I felt were a clear and present danger that might fall over, I did that. He never listened to me, and they all fell over, the ones that I told him would fall over. I even went to the mayor regarding this, Mayor Bloom, and she could do nothing about it. He then tried to intimidate and silence me by issuing me two bogus citations for tree pruning on private property, which I did no more than reduce these trees to cure them of a disease. And those trees are alive and well today because of what I did. I refused to pay the bogus vines, uh, fines, and I forced him to take me to Superior Court to prove his case, and I was found not guilty in both cases, and need there be further proof of this tyrannical behavior by this petty bureaucrat, all because I tried to protect the public from dangerous situations around town. Does this council need more proof than I have just offered to bring this bureaucratic tyrant under control and limit his mandate that you have given him? <coughs> he continues to use his power to frustrate and insult the public by, ins by interfering with the work performed by skilled, legitimate, licensed tree companies. This council should encourage him to start taking, doing his real job of taking care of our city trees that are in terrible condition. I will not bore you with more of the five other instances of his ridiculous behavior that he used to silence me and others in our industry using his office in an abusive way. Two other occasions, I have had, had to tell the fire department to call him and they had to tell him, let Tyburn do the work we have so mandated for the safety of the building. I can recount endless amounts of stories to back up his bizarre and ridiculous judgments. I believe it's time for this council to stop this time-honored practice of defending fellow bureaucrats, no matter how incompetent and stupid they are, and do what is best for the citizens of this city. On my next visit, I will show about 100 photos of trees he has failed to take care of here on our city streets. His reputation in this city is terrible because he has made the city the evil overseer that sends out spies from his committees to report on pruning that he doesn't like, so he can create a citation without any good reason. And a few, because someone has pruned a few feet off their overgrown tree without permission. As he told me once, and I'm quoting him, you can't prune that tree to a round top. It once had a pointed top. Unbelievable. If the public only knew what was going on in that evil mafia-like department, they would have stopped it immediately. But it's your people who should, you're the people who should look into my allegations and start working for public good, not this out of control, power crazed bureaucrat. Thank you very much for letting me. Thank you, Mr. Tyburn. Deliver that. The next speaker is Sophie Van Hunias. Hello. Today, my colleagues and I are here on behalf of CalPERG, which is an activist group on campus at UCSB. Um, and we're just here to deliver over 1,300 petitions um, in support of renewable energy in Santa Barbara. And we just wanted to thank you guys for all you've done in the past in support of renewable energy and solar energy, and hope that you continue this pursuit in the future in regard to community choice energy and microgrids. And thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Uh, Richard Paloch. <clears throat> Reset my clock. How much time do I get? <laughs> you get two minutes. Okay. First time I've been here. Uh, I own an RV. I'm also handicapped. Uh, the handicap status was given to me, not my vehicle. The vehicle is my conveyance to get there to be able to use my handicap status. By <clears throat> restricting me from being able to park where I used to, I almost lost my, my position in the art show. I'm an art artist on the Santa Barbara Art Walk. I'm there every Sunday. I used to park there. And now, now I, I, fortunately, I got another place. But I was parking in a handicapped spot. And I got five tickets, which I paid. And I argued in court 
very unsatisfactory because I don't understand when did you folks give the police department the okay to give handicap plated tickets to people parked in handicapped spots. Now, I know it's an RV, but since when, when I went to get my handicap position, they didn't give me any grief about having an RV. And let me go to my notes, it'd be the best way to do it. I'm lousy in public. One-on-one, -on -one, I'll take you on any time, but public, all right. People don't know how to drive RVs. Maybe you should get them to be able to pass a test to be able to drive an RV properly. As far as uh, being in the road too much and blocking access, buses pull up there, there all day long in the Cabrillo, Cabrillo Art Walk. Every day, or not every day, but on Sundays, I 15 see. 15 seconds. Great. Um, <clears throat> Anyways, when did you have the right to go ahead and tell me that my handicap position is no longer viable because I own an RV and that I'm denied access to parks, playgrounds, beach access to be able to enjoy the, uh, the abundance I'm of handicapped Santa Handicapped on RVs. Thank you. Yes, handicapped RVs. It's the other RVs. You know. Anyways, I wish I had presented it better. I'm better one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Mayor. May I, um, Richard, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your last name. Forgive me for addressing you by your first name. So you're invited to participate in the group that we put together on the ordinance committee. Um, Chair uh, Rouse is going to report on it in just, in just a minute. I think you were sitting in the audience and we are looking specifically at recreational vehicles. And I know you don't do it for recreation, right? RVs and people with disabilities. So yeah, please, uh, you have my number, so call, and, and will, we're convening I those meetings. Much. And I'm glad you're looking at this in a very, very good way instead of just brushing over it, that you're taking a deep look, which I, I appreciate a lot. Thank you. Thank you. The last speaker will be Phil Walker. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Pro Tem White and the rest of the council members. You know, I got out the vote. I voted at Franklin School, and it's great to interact with the pollsters, the good people down there. And, uh, you know, I vote the uh, personality, not the parter, party, excuse me, and I'm all over the roadmap, but uh, I actually had to write in a candidate for the Democratic uh, nominee, because I hear on the airways it's already been determined, but James Webb, a Marine Infantry Company commander in Vietnam in the Hill Fights, uh, former Assistant Secretary of Defense, former past governor of Virginia. I do not understand. Maybe he's like me, you get old and tired and just doesn't have the energy to participate. But uh, if I could, I could bring back Harry Truman. He had, he had the waivos to have to do it. And I'm sure I wouldn't be here talking to you because my dad was bombing the home islands right when those bombs were dropped. So. It's good to interact at uh, like Franklin Center with the poll polling Pete staff. One other quick thing, Oak Park. I was walking through there. I stopped off at the, the little bathroom, the men's room to utilize it. And come outside, there's a gentleman sitting there having a smoke break. And I look up and there's two, two newer signs. It says, no soccer, no football. What the heck? And he, he was a Latino gentleman. And he said, you know, He's sort of laughing too. He said, you might consider that racist. I sort of agree with him. I played soccer back in 63, 64 up in the Bay Area and I got the honest daylights kicked out of me because they did not have an, enough uh, staffing. So the coach brought two thirds of the football team on board to staff out the soccer, uh, uh, whatever you call it, the team. And <laughs> I. I it was unbelievable. It was more a rugby scrum than actual soccer. I played right wing, so somehow Thank I you. had the speed to avoid a little bit of it. But okay. you don't look at allowing soccer, a little bit of practicing at Oak Park, okay. due to the fact it's been very well disciplined. The dads and the uncles usually, Thank you. and Thank you know, Thank they, you, they handle it very well. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks. All right. That concludes our public comment. So let's continue with our consent agenda. Consent calendar, item four, subject records destruction for city administrator's office. 
Recommendation of the Council adopt by reading of title only a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara relating to the destruction of records held by the City Administrator's Office. Item 8, subject introduction of ordinance for lease agreement with Great Pacific Ice Cream. Recommendation that Council introduce and subsequently adopt by reading of title only an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara approving a five-year lease agreement with one five-year option with John K. Williams, Inc., a California corporation doing Pacific as Great Pacific Ice Cream at an average initial base rent of $4,053 per month for the 395-square-foot restaurant located at 219A Stearns Wharf. Item 9, introduction of an ordinance for lease agreement with Old Wharf Trading Company. Recommendation of the Council introduce and subsequently adopt by reading of title only an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara approving a five-year lease agreement with one five-year option with Stearns Wharf, Inc., a California corporation doing business as Old Wharf Trading Company at an average initial base rent of $13,278 per month adjusted seasonally for a 2,369-square-foot space located at 219 Stearns Wharf, Suites A, B, and D. Item 10, subject introduction of an ordinance for a lease agreement with Char West. Recommendation the Council introduce and subsequently adopt by reading of title only an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara approving a five-year lease agreement with one five-year option with John K. Williams, Inc., a California corporation doing business as Char West and an average initial base rate of 4,231 per month for the 1,069-square-foot space located at 221 Stearns Wharf. Item 11. Subject, introduction to ordinance for the assignment of lease agreement 24,741 Shoreline Beach Cafe. Recommendation that council introduce and subsequently adopt by reading of title only an ordinance of the city of Santa Barbara approving a consent to assignment of lease for agreement number 24,741 from Steve Marsh, Kevin Boss, and Beach Rock Inc., a California corporation, doing business as Shoreline Beach Cafe to Beach Rock Inc. Item 18. Local Coastal Program Planning Grant Application Resolution. Recommendation the Council adopt by reading of title only a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara supporting a grant application to update the City of Santa Barbara Local Coastal Program to complete a comprehensive update to the land use plan, comma, prepare a sea level rise adaptation plan, and address lower cost visitor serving accommodations. Item 19. Parking and Business Improvement Area Annual Assessment Report for Fiscal Year 2017, Intention to Levy. Recommendation of Council A, approve the Parking and Business Improvement Area Annual Assessment Report 2017, and B, adopt by reading of title only a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara declaring Council's intention to levy parking and business improvement area assessment rates for the 2017 fiscal year at a public hearing to be held on June 21, 2016 at 2 p.m., and number 20, subject, a resolution denying the appeal and upholding the decision of the Architectural Board of Review to grant project design approval for a proposed new seven-unit apartment building at 1818 Castillo Street. Recommendation that Council adopt by reading of title only a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara denying the appeal and upholding the decision of Architectural Board of Review to grant project design approval for a proposed new seven-unit apartment building at 1818 Castillo Street, pursuant to Council's direction of March 8th, 2016. Thank you. Uh, are there any items that, to, that Council folks would like to uh, pull off the consent agenda? Item 12 and item 18, please. 12 and 18. Any others? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I've got to recuse on item 19, as I am a PBI paying member. Okay. Any others? All right, well then let's go to item 12. Item 12, professional services agreement with Bilston Architecture and Planning Inc. for the Louise Lowry Davis Center renovation project. Okay, Mr. Hart. I just had a question about the projected total cost of the project. It doesn't mention that in the staff report. It just talks about the design services and just wanted to get a kind of sense as to how, um, how expensive this is. Mayor and council members, my name is George Thompson. I'm the capital project supervisor for the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, the cost for the construction is not uh, currently available because we are basically hiring this architect and the team to design improvements. Um, ballpark estimate would be 300000 to 500000 but as we work through this preliminary design, um, we'll really narrow that, that number down. Okay, that's what I needed to know, just order of magnitude. Thank you. 
M Mr. Mayor, may I speak to that point if we're moving Please, on? Please, Maria. Um, thank you. I've heard a lot of feedback from our older residents that they would really like to see Louise Lowry Davis Center become a full-fledged senior center. And I just wanted to express that to you since you're sitting there and um, just express my support for that as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, do we need to take that item separately, Mr. Harder? Just no, that's okay. fine. Just wanted to know the cost. Okay. Yeah. So item 18 then? Item 18, Local Coastal Program Planning Grant Application Resolution. Okay. And I guess my point in taking this off consent is just to say that, um, you know, we, we had initial grant in a couple hundred thousand dollar range from the Coastal Commission to do this work. We're at the point when this work was originally projected to be done. And I know that staff has worked through a lot of issues with local um, Coastal Commission staff and now has received a very significant letter from headquarters, I believe, um, delineating a number of additional issues that are really, really, really significant in their scope and complexity. And um, I think there are legitimate issues. There are serious things to be considered, but um, I don't know if they're soluble. You know, I, when you talk about sea level rise adaptation and low cost visitor serving accommodations in the coastal zone and in a very extremely expensive um, city, those are as tough an issues as you could possibly have. Um, I think the Coastal Commission has its own approach and vision as to what it wants to do in those in that regard, and I don't know that that matches up very well with our um, own planning process, and, and I don't know that spending more money and more time is gonna resolve those things. So I just, um, I had my concerns at the beginning of this process that we might get to this place. Um, I, I ha frankly just have to say, I think we're here. And um, I, I don't know what other council members think about this, but I, I, this is going to require even more money than, than this grant. And it's really gonna require um, significant staff work and particularly in terms of public outreach and um, dialogue. This is a mini version of the general plan update, and I don't know that we went into this process imagining that that was what it was gonna be, but here we are at a decision point, and um, I think we should really think uh, long and hard beyond a consent calendar item about going into the next phase of this. Mr. So, Mayor. So then we would pull this off the and have a have a full uh, presentation on that. Is that what you're, Mr. Suggesting? Mayor? If I could chime in real quick, Casey. Uh, we share a lot of council members' hearts concerns about where we're at in the process, and so we plan in the next two to three months to bring an item back to the council to talk about the status of where we're at and how or if we want to proceed because we think we are at that kind of critical policy juncture as well. Our recommendation would be let us continue to apply for this grant in case council decides they wanna continue forward with this process. This grant money can help pay for that additional cost. If we decide not to go forward or, or change, we can always decline the grant or no, not proceed with it. But we, we agree that uh, it's time for a policy check-in with the city council with where we're at and decide how to move forward. And we'll be bringing that back. Well, with that information, you know, I'd, I'd agree to continue just to keep the options open, but I do think we're, you know, this is the time to have this conversation before we commit to doing this work. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you for bringing that up, Mr. Hart. Anybody else have a comment on that? All right. Then we have item 19, which Mr. Rouse uh, must recuse himself on. Do you need to step out of the room or can, can he stay in the room? No. Okay. So may we have a, a Move motion? item 19, Mr. Mayor. You have a second? Sure. We have a motion and a second on item 19. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And okay, and with one, with one abstention. All right, for the rest of the consent agenda, do we have a motion for that? So moved. Second. Motion by Mario, second by Mr. Hotchkiss. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, passes unanimously. Okay, so that takes us through the consent agenda, and then we have a report from the Finance Committee. Mr. Hart. Mr. Mayor, the Finance Committee met today and uh, discussed alternatives to increase funding for streets capital. The bulk of the conversation was about uh, proposal staff is um, shopping with the committee to shift costs from the streets fund to general and enterprise funds. And um, the committee discussed those, didn't take any formal action, and staff will be coming back for at least two additional um, meetings to talk about other potential sources of revenue for streets capital in addition to the, the funding shifts. Great, thank you. 
and a report from the Ordinance Committee, Mr. Rass. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We uh, met today to discuss sort of continuation of the uh, hearing we had last week or two weeks ago on a oversized vehicle ordinance. Uh, we took some actions we wanted to forward along to Council. Uh, three actions were we had um, what was defined as option number two, which was uh, to vote on forwarding to Council uh, an oversized vehicle ordinance with some uh, refinements as uh, directed to staff. And that was voted uh, in favor, uh, two to one, Maria opposing. The second uh, item we did was form an ad hoc committee to to uh, engage uh, liaisons regarding some of the social uh, issues surrounding the um, surrounding the, uh, the issue of RVs and, and parking. And uh, that was uh, voted on three to zero. Uh, the last one was a, uh, a uh, form a liaison with the Access Advisory Committee to talk about uh, certain uh, disabled issues, and that was voted on two to one uh, with uh, Mario in opposition. And those were forwarded on to Council for consideration. Right. Thank you, Mr. Rass. All right, so that brings us to item 22. Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members, Joshua Hagmark, Water Resources Manager, and uh, here for another drought update. <coughs> be going over the final rainfall totals, uh, community conservation efforts, uh, water supply strategy, water, recycled water status update, lake and reservoir operations, drought response capital project highlights, uh, a uh, quick summary of the 2015 urban water management plan and our water conservation program. So rainfall totals, uh, we ended the year just, uh, just above half of normal. Um, which was certainly a far cry from where we hoped to end. Uh, Gibraltar with a little over 13 inches of rain. Normally we see a 26, 27 inches of rainfall in the back country. Um, and uh, as we talked about in past meetings, we were so close. Like that watershed had just gotten to the point where it was, it was uh, starting to get saturated. Had we seen a three or four inch rain event, we could have seen a couple hundred, if not a thousand acre feet of runoff. So it was, uh, it was terribly disappointing where, we, where it just stopped. Um, <clears throat> looking at the state, uh, certainly we are the epicenter of this drought right now. If you look at the dark red, which is the exceptional drought, situation. Uh, certainly things in Northern California have improved, but to, to note, they did get average rainfall this year. That's what Northern California ended up getting. Uh, it certainly has helped. It certainly eased the prices for us purchasing water this year and has allowed us to um, have a, a healthy reserve of water now in San Luis Reservoir for delivery. Community conservation continues to be a very positive situation with 41% conservation for April. Uh, continues to be, um, I mean, something this, this community can be very proud of. It really has in our, uh, the amount of regulations we've had to implement have been very light. And I think people have found ways to conserve in their own way and it's certainly been extremely helpful. Um, I did, because this is for the month of April. We were just getting in numbers. I wanted to have something for you. Roughly, May's conservation is somewhere around 40%. We still have to go through and subtract out some of the overlap agreements that we have where we deliver water to others, but it's gonna be very close to that. So um, where are we cumulatively since declaring a stage three with a solid 35% cumulative average? Um, it's been a while since we looked at this graphic. It's something I show to the Water Commission on a monthly basis. This is our gallons per capita per day. And I think it's got some helpful information in it. it um, our target, this red line here, uh, is the state requirement by the year 2020 to achieve uh, 117 gallons per capita per day. That was our goal for the community. Uh, we, as you can see with this blue line, we're currently uh, averaging, our 12 month average is 86. So we have gone way beyond what, what our 20 by 20 goal was. And then what you can see down here, this is part of our reporting to the state. We hover just over 50 gallons per capita per day is what our residential customers are using, which is just spectacular. Uh, the state considers 55 gallons per capita per day to be basic health and safety needs. So um, I, on every single measure, I feel like the community is, is continuing to, to do a fantastic job. Our water supply strategy, um, 
not much to note here from past months. What, what you will see in the next update is we just got confirmation today and I kind of wanted to wait off until we got that confirmation of the purchase of the 4,000 acre feet from AVEC. And so what, we're, what you'll see that supplemental water, we're gonna put that into our supply strategy. And um, based on some recent um, discussions as of yesterday with the state, we're gonna be pushing out our planning horizon three years. They wanna see uh, what our water supply plan looks out. So it will be adding 2019 onto here and what that looks like. So that'll be in our next update that we see. Um, but clearly, uh, just summarizing, you can see that desal coming online in October timeframe is going to be uh, play a very critical role next year in helping us to meet demand along with the need for conservation. Supply management, um, just recapping, we did receive a 60% final state water allocation, which is a roughly just shy of 2,000 acre feet. Uh, we completed a purchase of about 4,000 acre feet of, of AVEC water. Uh, so this is our, our war chest of water that we're building up and certainly it's, it's part of the deliveries for next year and the following. Um, as we've talked about in the past, conveyance is really the limitation. We can only move so much water through the state water pipeline, but things have been improving in the sense that we've been able to utilize other water agencies' capacity. Uh, we, I think we'd been, want to be forthcoming with, that was one of the risks of whether we were gonna need to implement additional conservation measures, but so far we've been successful. Montecito and Carpinteria have been um, utilizing their either lake storage or groundwater storage and have not been taking advantage of deliveries to the lake. So we've been able to, along with Goleta, take advantage of that, and that is helping our position going into the late summer when we expected to see a potential shortage. And so we'll continue to bring that to your attention and continue to monitor that, but at this time we don't anticipate needing additional uh, short-term regulations. Um, uh, Mr. Hagmark, on, on that front, there, there's been conversation about some additional conveyance opportunities to expand the ability to, to bring water into Kachuma. Can you give us a, a, a word on how that's going? Any yes, progress there? Absolutely, Mayor Pertem, we've been working closely with CCWA, uh, Central Coast Water Authority, to see what we could do to increase those deliveries. And the easy one was uh, typically in November, they shut down the system in order to do maintenance. And um, they're, they feel like we can get through another year without doing that maintenance, so we're gonna be deferring it. But that allows us to deliver several hundred acre feet of additional water in November, which was critical. And uh, along with that, they are making some modifications to the piping coming in and over the dam. And so we'll be able to boost production by a couple uh, cubic feet per second, which adds a couple acre feet a day to the lake. All those little things kind of adding up. Uh, I believe the price tag for all the little modifications they were making was like 180,000 and ultimately will yield s some significant deliveries to the lake. So. We continue to push that system, uh, sensitive to making sure that it continues to operate and it doesn't go down in some type of failure. That's one of the things we're very cognizant of. But um, yeah, we're working at this from multiple fronts. Thank you. Uh, Kachuma storage. Uh, so this is key. We, we You'll see in some later graphics I have that we're starting to build up a surplus of state or imported water in Kachuma. And that's gonna be really critical to helping us meet our demands come uh, late summer. So on the demand management side, um, it's really key that we continue to get that 35% conservation. Um, I should update this. I said as of Monday, it kind of changed on me here. Uh, we do see not new regulations, but new requirements. We need to be doing our planning now for three years out. That's what the state came out with on Monday, and we have until June 22nd to uh, share with the state how we plan to do that. So we're gonna be putting those plans together. Fortunately, we've already been planning out two years, so we'll just be adding to that, that, uh, that graphic. Um, regulations, we do not anticipate the need for new regulations, and as I mentioned earlier, we are not, uh, we are kind of backing away from the, from the need for a short-term uh, regulations right now. Certainly we're keeping this in our back pocket. We're gonna be watching this closely and reporting to council, but we feel like we will have at least a month or so head start if we start to see we're not 
we're not able to make, keep deliveries or our conservation efforts are starting to fall short. So we feel pretty good about it at this time. Uh, recycle water status update, just wanted to recap. Uh, the facility was designed to produce two and a half million gallons a day. Uh, we had sustainable production at 0.75 MGD and lately have been getting it up to about one million gallons a day. Our goal for this summer is to get it up to 1.5 MGD. That would allow us to meet average summer demand, peak demands. Uh, we do plan to use the Valverde well, uh, which produces about 0.2 MGD. Um, but as it stands right now, uh, we do not have enough production to meet demand. However, we've been talking uh, with our water uh, filtration expert that we brought on, and he is and his firm are feeling very comfortable that by July um, they can get the facility up to 1.5 MGD. And I will um, continue to be discussing this item. Certainly, if that's not the, the case by July, we'll be looking to ask our recycled water customers for conservation. Um, very keen to not put any potable water in our recycled water system this summer. Um, and so trying to control that by demands. Uh, as far as Kachuma goes, we're at 14 and a half percent of capacity. And uh, there have been a lot of recent events that I wanted to bring to your attention. The grand jury report that came out um, pertaining to the operation of Lake Kachuma. And we will be, as many water agencies, will be uh, putting together a response. We have 90 days to respond to uh, the recommendations in that. So our, our report is due by August 13th. And of course, that's going to come back to the full council for review and approval before we submit anything. We anticipate sometime in late July we bring that back. Uh, barge relocation uh, is on track to be moved June 22nd to the 24th. You'll probably see a lot of media press about that. they are going to be um, trying to time that such that uh, there's very little impact. We're very fortunate in Santa Barbara that we have Laurel Reservoir. It has about a week's worth of water on this side of the mountain and allows us to be a nice buffer. But we'll be working to help minimize the impacts of the shutdown to Goleta, which is directly off the pipeline. And so uh, they'll have to fill up all of their reservoirs. And then we're going to be assisting them through our connections that we have with them to make sure that their customers have adequate water during that shutdown. And then water releases for steelhead continues to be a real challenge. We support the Bureau of Reclamation's proposal to relocate the fish to a hatchery to ensure their survival. It's been really challenging. Uh, we are running out of water, and certainly when they do the downstream release this summer, there will not be adequate water to deliver to, um, to Hilton Creek, which is where this uh, population of steelhead that we've been trying to protect is at. And it's been very frustrating. There is a, um, a committee that's been put together to try and come up with solutions. And unfortunately, they're stymied. And um, it's been very frustrating. We certainly have invested a lot in, in protecting this um, species. And we certainly would hate to just see uh, them be stranded without water. And so we've been looking to try and find solutions. And unfortunately, right now, um, just running into challenges with the National Marine Fisheries um, being responsive to some of these concerns. Uh, they, they seem to be fine with not doing anything, which doesn't sit well with us. We really would like to do something to protect these fish. Do you have any idea what number of fish we're talking about? Uh, I just se several hundred. Yeah, it's 250 to 300. Would that yeah. be a, a ballpark number? And the challenge is we don't know how many of them are steelhead and how many of them are regular trout. Regular trout are not endangered. And the challenge is it's, it's really um, only through genetic testing that they can actually figure that out. So I just wanted to run through, this is uh, basically what remains in the lake. And uh, what we have is this unallocated water. This is water that has either infiltrated into Tecolote Tunnel or has fallen via rainfall on the lake. 
and that water currently is being used to satisfy evaporation on the lake. And that we expect to be exhausted by July. Carryover, this is the water that the um, member units have been able to save through conservation and other measures. And we expect this to be exhausted by October, late October. This blue line here is what is starting to grow as imported water. This is the water that is being banked in the lake, imported and saved in the lake. That little sliver right there is what remains of the fish water uh, that we have, and that is expected to be exhausted sometime late this month. And uh, we'll be looking to the Bureau as to where any additional water would be coming from. This BNA ANA account, this is the uh, downstream user water that is stored in the lake. They anticipate doing uh, releasing all of this water uh, sometime late July, early August. And, um, and so we really are talking about the only remaining water being in there, the minimum pool and whatever imported water we can get into the lake. Just a little uh, updated picture. This is um, our local resident, Bill Dewey, who takes a lot of photos around town. Uh, allowed us to use this picture he took. There's the intake tower. Uh, we're basically looking pretty much due south here. Um, you can kind of see the these dotted outline here. This is the uh, location of the pipeline that they're putting in. Here's the current barge location. And here's where they're gonna be moving the barge to. It's basically a deeper part of the lake. Uh, as for the desal project, it's, it is moving along. Uh, they're pouring, finishing pouring the footings for the three treatment units. You can see the kind of the staged, this is one, two, and three. Um, the treatment units are in transit. They've arrived at Long Beach and are, are being um, unloaded and, and stockpiled there and set up for delivery so they can put them on place. We have delivered one of those units. I have a picture of it. Um, uh, we're working on satisfying the permit conditions related to all the offshore work, making sure that um, uh, there are conditions of uh, anchoring plan. We had to basically do an assessment and make sure that there were no impacts to the marine environment out there. Uh, contaminated soils is ongoing as, it's, as we come across it, but at this point it's a fairly minor element. And um, we're still on schedule for October, but um, there are a lot of concerns with the schedule. There are every, all the float in the schedule is gone, and um, there are some critical items related to electrical, and to kind of go into some more detail on that, the media that is used to filter out um, particulates in the water uh, actually has to mature. It has to, we have to run th water through it and actually get biological growth going on it and in order for it to be effective. And so it literally, we have to have power uh, about two months prior to actually delivering water so that they can mature this media. And so it's really important that the electrical come online. Um, and we're working closely with SCE, just making sure they understand this is a priority. And then of course the offshore work, making sure uh, we just recently, you know, have to do surveys on a regular basis. There was a grunion run, and so therefore it limited what work activity could occur uh, on, sh on shore. And so those kind of things could, could really play havoc if we continue to have a, um, see grunion showing up. So here's uh, just a little aerial photo showing the site. You can see the, the uh, three skids here. Uh, here is the, the first unit to show up. And um, I think they just got it delivered. As you can see, seven of these make up one treatment train, and we have three of them. So basically, 21 of these units will show up on site. Uh, basically, in the next month or so, they'll be showing up and uh, putting them in place. This is just a, a nice aerial photo of the um, outfall box. There, um, it's basically where all the uh, conduits electrical come together and go out to sea. And uh, you notice the contractor has his protected fencing up. That black line is actually the uh, dredge line. It has nothing to do with this project. But uh, certainly uh, right there on the water, especially given all the erosion that occurred over the winter. 
the Montecito Water Sales Agreement, uh, we have been in discussions with them about the funding agreement. They have a special board meeting this Friday to take up, take up the matter, and um, we'll see. At this point, they are um, going around in circles about the costs of doing this, some of the preliminary design work and some of the costs associated with negotiations. Um, hopefully, they'll get some clear direction from their board on Friday, and, and we can figure out what the next steps are. Uh, the 2015 uh, Urban Water Management Plan, uh, we issued the, drought, uh, the draft on April 29th and have discussed it at Water Commission on the 21st and 19th, and we have a public hearing scheduled here with Council on June 28th. Um, the Urban Water Management Plan is a requirement of the state every five years, and um, it's part of what feeds into the uh, 2020 goal of 117 gallons per capita day per day. For us, this is not our only planning document. This is really a more of a reporting document that, and it's pretty laid out by the state what you have to report on. For us, the long-term water supply plan is really our guiding planning document. Um, it provides us the, the policy, the direction, and um, but for some organizations, the urban water management plan is all they do. And so uh, I think it plays a much bigger role uh, for them. Um, but we see uh, the urban water management plan um, ultimately is a snapshot that basically tells where we are now. Uh, we put a lot of time, staff time, into that document, and if you hadn't had a chance to look at it, it's it, it's a pretty good overview of everything that's going on. Um, so the just to touch on, since I mentioned the long-term water supply plan, um, we plan to update that, and uh, the current plan is as soon as this current drought ends. Um, we want to reflect potential changes in operations of Kachuma and the safe yield there. Uh, we'll be reflecting the future role of desal, um, finishing our, our feasibility study of potable reuse, how that plays into it. Uh, we expect the long-term water supply plan update to be a, a multi-year, probably two, good two years uh, in the making and get plenty of public input on that document. Um, so that's something which, that's hanging out there and, and we're ready to jump on as soon as this, this uh, drought shows some relief. And at this time, I'm going to turn over to Ms. Ward, our Water Conservation Coordinator. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the Council, my name is Madeline Ward, and I will share with you a few slides on our WaterWise High School video contest. This is an annual countywide program, and it's currently in its 17th year. All of the high schools in the county can participate. Um, they, the high school students produce 30 second videos and it's a great program um, because it's a, an, an opportunity for local students to showcase their creative filmmaking skills while also promoting wise water use. The videos are judged on originality, inter entertainment value, production quality and value of information. And the winning videos are used as PSA ads in movie theaters. For the student prizes, we have sponsors that donate these for first, second, third, the People's Choice Award, and the Honorable Mention. This year, our corporate sponsors for the students were Ramada Santa Barbara, True Nature Landscape Architecture, Ewing Irrigation, All Around Landscape Supply, and NCM Movie Theaters. And this year we had our best year yet. We had 22 videos that were entered. And this theme, since we announced it in the fall, we weren't sure if we were gonna get rain or shine. So this, the theme this year was water conservation in the forecast, how to be water wise outside rain or shine. We got a lot of great videos. They were very fun to watch. And our People's Choice Award was also via Facebook in terms of watching them on Facebook and liking the, um, the winning videos. And if all goes according to plan, we should be able to watch our first place video here. <laughs> okay, unfortunately, I wish Joshua and I could act it out, but it's a cartoon. Um, we tried it once about an hour ago and we were hoping it would last long enough for us to be able to watch it. Um, 
but we'll have to fix that for the future. So the winning video was Carpentry High School, second place was Dunn School, and Santa Barbara High won third place. Um, and we do have it on our website if you do want to watch any of the winning videos. And we're here for any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Ward. Mr. Rouse? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would, uh, first of all, like to make a comment about um, the communication from staff and obviously the results of the community that's been just outstanding and, and a big congratulations to a community that doesn't need to be beat up any further by regulation. They are doing the <coughs> job. They're doing a, a certain amount of esprit de corps, which I think is something that we can, we can truly appreciate from this, this end going forward. I did have a request, um, Mr. Hagmark, just about because it's a, it's a question that comes up constantly because everybody sees the development of construction around us. And I know you've brought it up before. Could you give just a quick synopsis of the water budget and the percentage that the new development that is in the pipeline or underway causes in the water budget itself? Because it is something that it's on everybody's mind because they're going by these countless huge construction projects from all the way out at the end of Hollister to here downtown on the waterfront. And it's, it's a concern, but it's hard to, to express what that means in the big picture. Could you give us just a very quick synopsis on that, please? So we, we have a spectrum of, of our uh, commercial, sorry, of development coming online. And it's been anywhere from six acre feet to 40 acre feet. And lately it's been in that 20 acre feet range is what new development is bringing on. We use about 10,000 acre feet a year. Um, so it makes up a, a very, very small percent of our overall supply and doesn't really play a big difference in how we move forward. But, but as we've discussed, there's certainly a lot of, of um, there's a lot of jobs are surrounding it. And if it doesn't change the way that we do our water supply planning, it seems, it seems challenging to, to, to stop it. And that includes all the, all the hotel rooms coming online and all the other uh, things we see that are coming up out of the ground. That's in the, those are the, in the numbers that you're talking about. That's correct, and, and that assumes um, a pretty worst case scenario when we, we assume every fixture and every hotel and everything is operating. And, and certainly, as we know, it, that's, it's typically not that much water is used. And uh, what we find with most of the new developments is they're required to have the latest in water conservation fixtures. And so typically, if they're tearing down, it depends on what repla they're replacing. But in some cases, they're actually using less water than what the previous tenant was using. And so um, those, those upgrades can be really beneficial. They're really limited on what kind of landscaping they can have. So uh, development for us is, is a much different situation than what Goleta has, where they have you know, open land that's being developed and there has been no, you know, significant use there before. It, it, we're just, it's, it's, it's a di very different situation here um, related to that. Thank you. Mr. Dominguez, did you have a question? I have a question, but, but just to follow up on that, I guess one of the things that complicates that discussion is the uh, additional water costs a lot more than the water we've used in the past. So even though some of the new development uses a lot less water because it's more efficient, it still shows up on the chart because it's a lot more expensive, almost by a factor of 10 in some cases. So I think that's, that's important to keep in mind too. Not all water has equal prices and is equally available. The um, question I had was regarding the um, number, let's see, which slide was it? Can I add one more of what we were looking for your question? Sure. Um, our long-term water supply plan contemplated growth in this community, and despite planned growth uh, that we found in our general plan, we anticipated over the next 20 years to actually reduce our water needs, and that was based on conservation, the implementation of more energy efficient, water efficient devices. So uh, despite the growth that you see going on, the, we still anticipate that in 20 years, our water usage will be less than what it was going into this current drought. And, the, and that's good news. There's some things we're working on that hopefully will hit the agenda sooner rather than later, um, which would allow our current residents to upgrade their toilets, do gray water conversions. It's a financing. Uh, mechanism for them. So hopefully we can get that through the system so that people can upgrade their uh, equipment. So the question was, um, 
you mentioned with the recycled water, we're looking at um, 0.75, and then it may boost up to one. And then the goal for the summer is one and a half MGD. And then you will consider 20 to 35% voluntary reduction if the goal can't be achieved. So if we're meeting the need now, does this change in the peak period because their usage goes up or because other people's conversa conservation doesn't go down? It's because demand goes up. It follows the landscape needs. I mean, that's, that's the thing we could, um, with a million gallons a day, we could provide most of the water needs, recycled water needs for most of the year. But when we have those peak demands, we can't store recycled water. I mean, we have reservoirs, but they're relatively small. It's not like we can have a, a lake that we can put this water in. And so it's we, we do run into these times, and that's why the facility was sized like it was, is to be able to handle this July, August, September peak demand when everybody is irrigating and wants water, recycled water at the same time. And so that's what we're trying to gear up for and um, you know it's unfortunate that we haven't been able to to prove that the system will, will get there so that's that's exactly what we hope to we're making some tweaks to it and we hope to get to that level by July okay and then the, the other half of that is on the demand management temporary regulations restricting water use could entail limitations on outdoor water use and methods of irrigation how much what percentage would that uh, be if you could uh, estimate with is that like in the 10 percent range or what more can you eke out of the system in that line item well see we're just we're discussing that internally which is um it'll be based on the shortage that we identify and that's been part of part of the challenge with that we'd want to come back and be surgical about that if we just need you know six weeks of and we need to free up 500 acre feet of water, you know, that for example, then we can take that in and start looking at some of the conservation efforts that, and maybe just limiting sprinkler use for that six weeks would be enough to save that 500 acre feet that we need to save. So those are the, um, at this point we haven't identified a shortage and that's what we wanna, if we can, we certainly wanna, don't wanna do it. And so we just wanna make sure that the council and the community is aware that potentially that, that could happen if we, we see a change in our in our situation. And what's your, your forecast on how much we could save if the need became really pressing? Um, well, we've, we went through that we went through that a few months ago. What um, I don't think we'd be looking to do any type of outdoor watering ban. That isn't where we'd wanna go. Um, I think we'd be looking to try and match up the conservation with what our shortage is looking to be, not try and take it any further than we need it to go. Um, but we have a lot of tools in our toolbox that we can take to and we'll pr bring those forth to the council and, and with a recommendation. Because I know um, the slide you showed that showed how much we have conserved is pretty amazing, 41% reduction in April. And in the summertime, according to this chart, uh, this is page seven, the, both our actual usage and the drought target expand and I'm assuming that's just because irrigation needs and household needs go up a little bit because of the heat. So is the idea that we could keep this red line relatively flat if we needed to? And so maybe eke out, you were talking about 500 acre feet? I just threw that out as, okay. I don't know what our shortage is gonna be, but it it's that could be some reasonable target that we'd be looking for. And again, our all our planning is based on that blue line here, which is a 35% conservation. Um, so presumably if we're in that area and we're able to deliver the water that we need, we don't anticipate that, that shortage. But certainly there is a uh, seasonality effect to it and that's what we're gonna be watching. Once we feel like we get through October, then we'll be looking ahead to next summer and meeting those peak demands if we don't see any rainfall. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Maria. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Hart. Oh, um, well, I'm starting to get a little bit concerned that everybody's doing too good a job on conservation. I mean, they, they, they can't really say that seriously, but from an economic standpoint, it is a real concern. Um, we were projected to be saving financially the model works on the 35% conservation target. If we're at 40% now, is it your sense that this 40% has to do with just the weather that's been, you know, 
luckily cooler than it was last year at the same time of year. But um, I think there will be additional conservation when the rates um, kick in. And so are we getting in a potential situation where we have, from, from a financial standpoint, too much conservation that requires us to revisit the rates and increase them and get into that kind of cycle that other agencies have been in where rates lower revenues to the point where you can't make it all pencil out. Right, we try to been uh, try and trying to be very uh, you know one thing at a time because each each change you make has a, a ramification. Um, but I don't want there to be any confusion out there with the community. Conservation is our number one priority financially. We'll we'll figure out how to make it pencil out, um, and um, certainly we share the concerns with. With rates, uh, we do believe the 40% conservation has a lot to do with what I would consider normal May temperatures, normal June temperatures where we get our fog. We haven't seen that for four or five years now. Um, a welcome sight. If I can't get rain, I always say I'll take the fog. It's perfect, you know, because it does cl cut down on the evaporation and demand for water. So um, I'll take what we can get. And right now, we, we really do need this conservation to get us through that peak at peak summer demand time, so I'm, I'm welcoming it, welcoming this. So if this ha if this were to continue and um, we got in that revenue problem, the strategy would be to tap the brakes on capital expenses like the water main replacement project or something like that? Is that the? We'll bring back a whole bunch of options to take a look at. We're very fortunate, and then it looks like we're gonna end this fiscal year with our reserves at policy. So that gives us some freedom and, and the rate structure has been designed to use about five million of reserves. Okay. But we're very fortunate to be this far into the drought and have reserves in as good a shape as they are. And and that's been, you know, a lot of good planning, a lot of good discussions about what is really important right now and we've cut back on a lot of our expenditures to make this to make that happen. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And and Mr. Hagmark, wouldn't the um deal with Montecito that would that would help the city financially the following year would that is that is that the case or is that the way that it that agreement uh is playing out I mean they they'll be paying the city over 20 years so it's 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 it, in a long range it, it would be it's going to it would be a helpful partnership for both them and us uh in the short term um it's still too speculative to know what benefits, significant benefits there'd be in that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right, well, I don't see any other lights on for questions, so thank you very much for that. Uh, obviously, you, the, the water agency team is, is doing an amazing job, and uh, thank you for your, for your extra efforts. And certainly, uh, for those who haven't looked at that urban uh, water management plan, uh, I guess it's coming back to council soon, it's, uh, it's Actually, the, its introduction is a very good document for sort of bringing everything together. And, and uh, uh, as, as Mr. Hackmark said, it's a good snapshot. All right. Well, that uh, we'll move on then to council and staff communications. Mr. Hotchkiss. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, along with the other mayor and Mr. Hart, uh, I was at the inaugural flight from coming in from Dallas. So I think we now have 11 uh, cities that we fly to. Uh, there were 70 passengers going one way and 50 going the other. Some of the people were really shocked they got off the plane and there was the mayor greeting them. You know, I, I sort of pretended, oh, we do this all the time, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was all good news. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? All right, well then let's move on then to uh, closed sessions. I guess that's our, our next piece here. Item 23, subject conference with city attorney pending litigation and item 24, subject conference with city attorney anticipated lit litigation. And we don't anticipate any report out from this. So uh, after that, uh, this meeting will be adjourned.